Welcome to News Wrap Local. I'm your host, Justin Chapman. Thanks for being here. Happy Latino Heritage Month. After providing a few brief updates on this month's local stories, we'll speak with our guest, new Pasadena City Manager, Miguel Marquez. But before we get started, let's check out these Pasadena Media News Briefs. On July 18th, the Pasadena City Council adopted all three resolutions related to the inclusion of the Pasadena Public Library Services Continuation Measure on the November 8th general election ballot. If approved, the measure would continue the city's collection of the library special tax due to end in February of 2023. The measure authorizes the city of Pasadena to levy a special parcel tax on real property. Current rates are approximately $41 per single family dwelling, $27 per apartment unit, and $299 per non-residential parcel. According to city staff, the tax generates $2.8 million in funding per year, which is used for the city library's purchase of books and materials, homework programs, and other library services. The Pasadena Public Library Services Continuation Measure is the second measure that will be included on the November ballot. The City Council has conducted a second reading of an ordinance that would modify the city's municipal code to permit outdoor dining in the public right-of-way. Previously, the code provided for the use of public walkways for sidewalk dining with an appropriate permit. The code also set forth a notice and hearing process for the issuance of sidewalk permits. The modified ordinance further deletes the provision for notice and hearing of sidewalk dining permits. Pasadena instituted outdoor dining along sidewalks, alleys, and portions of barricaded streets in May 2020, after it passed an amendment to its local emergency declaration relating to restaurants and retail businesses during the COVID-19 pandemic. Although the city set a fee schedule, permit fees were waived in support of local businesses suffering from the impact of the pandemic. Governor Gavin Newsom signed SB 1327, a major gun reform bill jointly authored by Senators Anthony Portentino and Bob Herzenberg. SB 1327 allows private citizens to sue a person who manufactures, distributes, transports, imports, or sells assault weapons, 50 caliber rifles, ghost guns, or ghost gun kits in California. It allows citizens to sue for $10,000 on each weapon involved, as well as recovery of attorney's fees. In a statement, Portentino said, the continued need to adopt sensible solutions to our nation's tragic history of gun violence is dire and necessary. That includes SB 1327, which I am proud to jointly author with Senator Hertzenberg. I am grateful to Governor Newsom for his partnership on this important bill that will keep our communities safe and improve public safety for all Californians. SB 1327 continues Senator Portentino's record as one of California's most ardent gun reform advocates. A reminder that a public service for Pasadena City Council member John Kennedy, who passed away in July, will be held from 5 to 6.30 p.m. on Friday, September 30th, in front of City Hall. A reception will follow from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Let's turn next to our lightning round of news updates. One, on the housing front, the rent control charter amendment now has a letter. It is Measure H. Meanwhile, Governor Newsom signed SB 1177, which creates a $23 million regional trust between Pasadena, Burbank, and Glendale to finance affordable housing projects. Also, Pasadena's housing department released the results of a community survey about homelessness in the city. There were 216 responses and 50% said permanent housing should be expanded, 40% said mental health services, and 36% said emergency shelter and interim housing. Under areas for consideration for improvement, 62% said permanent housing has the greatest need for improvement among Pasadena's existing homeless response system. Two, three Pasadena residents have qualified for the late John Kennedy's District 3 City Council seat. 
Friendship Baptist Pastor Lucia Smith, recent District 3 candidate and Human Relations Commission Chair Brandon Lamar, and Engineer and Environmental Advisory Commission Chair Justin Jones. The three candidates participated in a candidates forum yesterday hosted by Conversation Live, Pasadena Community Coalition, and Pasadena Black Pages. The council will appoint the new council member on September 29th, the day before the Kennedy Memorial and ahead of the October 4th deadline. An ad hoc committee of the council discussed the appointment process and recommended that applicants give a five to seven minute introduction and overview of their background, qualifications, and involvement in city and district three issues in front of the council. The council will then ask them for follow-up questions uh, with each applicant spending up to 45 minutes speaking to the council. The ad hoc committee said council members should not meet with applicants outside the public interview process. The appointed council member will serve the remainder of Kennedy's current term until December 12th, when the newly seated city council will have to make a District 3 appointment again, this time to cover the four-year term Kennedy won in the June primary. District 3 residents will next get to vote for their council member in 2024. Three, LA County Public Works has begun its annual maintenance work near Devil's Gate in the Arroyo to remove about 45,000 cubic yards of sediment and prevent flooding. The work will continue through December 15th and it is expected to have a smaller impact than the recent Big Dig, the three-year Devil's Gate Reservoir Restoration Project, which was met with extensive community opposition and lawsuits. Tim Brick, Managing Director at Arroyo Seco Foundation, said it's gonna take many years for Hahamungna to recover from the excavation program that the county has conducted. Four, a jury awarded $26 million to an 11-year-old former PUSD special education student who was sexually assaulted at school by three of her male classmates in May 2016, causing her to be later institutionalized. A teacher's aide who was tasked with supervising the student left her unsupervised, leading to the assault. POSD denied both the attack and the district's negligence and argued at trial that the student suffered no damages as a result of the district's conduct and therefore she shouldn't be awarded any damages. The jury disagreed. Five, an ad hoc committee of the Civilian Police Oversight Commission recommended charges to the Pasadena Police Department's use of force policy to require all officers who witness categorical use of force or even point their gun at someone to report their observations in writing to their supervisor. They also recommended changing policy language to prevent officers from shooting at or from moving vehicles and prohibit officers who have a sustained use of force complaint from training other officers. Police department leadership will then provide feedback on the recommendations, which will then go back to the Oversight Commission next month. Meanwhile, a police department spokesperson said the administrative case of the Anthony McLean officer-involved shooting is still pending review, and that the release of those records will adhere to Senate Bill 1421, which requires certain investigative records be made public. Six, the Rose Bowl Legacy Foundation completed its $40 million fundraising campaign, which began in 2017. That includes $13.75 million in state and federal grants. The funds will go towards capital needs, educational initiatives, and enhancing the stadium's safety. Seven, the Human Relations Commission will consider next month whether to recommend to City Council to remove portraits and plaques from City Hall and other city facilities of officials who led racial segregation campaigns in the mid 20th century. Council member Tyrone Hampton has called for the removal of photos of Mayor Albert Stewart and Hahn and Hahn managing partner Herbert Hahn, who called for whites only real estate covenants in Pasadena. Eight, Omicron booster shots are now available in Pasadena. LA County Public Health Director Barbara Ferrer said the newly appointed COVID 19 vaccine booster, which targets the BA4 and BA5 subvariants of the Omicron strain, is safe and effective. Quote, viral data from around the world was used to inform updates of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. At this point of the pandemic, 
There is extensive safety and effectiveness data on the mRNA vaccines and their effectiveness against COVID-19, end quote. Go to myturn.ca.gov or vaccinatelacounty.com to schedule an appointment. Also, the Pasadena Public Health Department recently appointed an interim director, Dr. Eric Handler, formerly Orange County's health officer, who will fill in for Dr. Yingying Go while she completes a 12-month fellowship in Washington, D.C. Nine, the 24th annual Pasadena Latino Heritage Parade returns this year for the first time since 2019 and will take place from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Saturday, October 1st at Villa Park. Local schools, community groups, elected officials, dignitaries, and neighbors will be at the event, sponsored by the City of Pasadena and the Pasadena Latino Heritage Committee. And 10, the City's Municipal Services Committee this week approved a list of 19 transportation projects to be funded by $230.5 million from Metro. Those Measure R funds were originally slated for the 710 Tunnel Project then the grade separation project over the train tracks at California Boulevard and Raymond Avenue. Those projects were nixed in 2018 and 2021. The train overpass was abandoned after it was determined that it would cause major traffic disruptions over four years and would likely go over budget. Some of the new approved projects include a roadway network on Pasadena Avenue and St. John Avenue, an Avenue 64 Complete Streets program, Gold Line at grade crossing enhancements, and 710, 134, and 210 freeway ramp modifications. The project list will now go to the City Council for consideration and then to Metro for final approval. Let's patch in our guest, Pasadena City Manager Miguel Marquez. Thank you so much for coming on the show and welcome to Pasadena. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Miguel served as the Chief Operating Officer of Santa Clara County. He was responsible for all operations of the county, the largest in Northern California, with nearly 2 million residents, 22,000 full-time employees, and an annual operating budget in excess of $11 billion. Before that, he was the first Latino justice to be confirmed to California's Sixth District Court of Appeals. He was also the County Counsel for Santa Clara County the General Counsel of the San Francisco Unified School District and a Deputy City Attorney in the San Francisco City Attorney's Office. So can can you start by introducing yourself to the Pasadena community, telling us about your background, what what experiences and skills do you have that that led you to being selected for this role? Sure, thank you for uh, again for having me. And, you know, going over that brief resume that I have, you know, I think it's clear that uh, I've dedicated my career to public service for a long, long time now and have had a number of different roles. Um, and, you know, it actually goes back even before I started working. I would say <clears throat> I was in college and actually I went to college uh, and had intended to be an engineer. I think, you know, the the goings on in a college setting makes you think about what you want to be and what you want to do. And even though I started as an engineer, I ended up graduating back in 1989 from Stanford University with a a bachelor's degree in public policy. Back when uh, that degree choice was not, I think there was all of eight of us in my class that uh, got a bachelor's degree in public policy, but I was just so um, clear in my mind that I wanted to be a public servant. I followed that up immediately by getting a master's degree in public policy. So I've been in the public realm for a while and I started working I graduated from Harvard uh, in 1991 and wanted to work in government, but uh, some folks may remember that at the early 90s, we had a severe recession and it was difficult as government was laying people off. So I ended up working for a private firm called KPMG Pete Marwick, which was a consulting firm, but I was in their um, state and local government consulting branch. Uh, And I did that work until I realized that so much of what we do in this society, because we're, a, a, you know, we're a, a society based on the rule of law. And I realized that uh, to continue to do the work I wanted to do in public service, it would be very helpful to have a law degree. So I went back to UC Berkeley, got my law degree, uh, started in private practice to pay off some of the bills. That lasted about a year and a half. And then I said, now let me go back to what I wanted to do the whole time, which is be a public servant. And I went to go lawyer uh, for the public sector, first the county of San Mateo, then the city and county of San Francisco, San Francisco Unified, as you mentioned, the county of Santa Clara, 
was eventually appointed to be a judge and then came back to the county, back to the county as chief operating officer and got into the operational side uh, and just loved it uh, for six years, six uh, years of which three of them involved the pandemic, the wildfires, all the stuff we've all been dealing with. Uh, and uh, at some point, you know, had always had in the back of my mind, because I have a lot of extended family here in Southern California, that I wanted to come to Southern California. But I felt I had the best the, the, uh, the best public sector job in, in Northern California. Mm-hmm. So I sort of had to wait until the best public sector job in Southern California opened up. And when it did, it was called the city manager of the city of Pasadena. Uh, I looked at it, um, saw who was the, the city council, who was the mayor, the vice mayor. So, you know, the people I'd be working with, the staff, you know, it's great. Everything's on the Internet these days. So I had a lot of time to read up on everybody, the community, the press, just everybody. And every box that I was looking at was check, check, check. This is the right place. So I submitted my paperwork, interviewed, and was uh, so fortunate to be selected by the council and the mayor uh, to serve as city manager. But I would say, by and large, biggest thing to know about me is I'm a lifelong, well, I don't know about lifelong, but a public servant for at least the last about 35 years. Hmm. Well, yeah, I went to Berkeley as well. So go Bears. Um, I, I believe you said you're you're moving to Pasadena, right? Which would make you, I think, the first city manager to live in the city in something like 15 or 20 years. Have, have you completed that transition? And, and why was that important to you? It, um, I have moved down. Uh, and yeah, I live on the sort of uh, eastern side of the city. And I've completed that transition. There may be a few boxes here and there that need to be uh unpacked but yeah it's very important i think for the city manager especially someone coming in from the outside to really live with the community to deal with the streets to you know see the city every day that i drive in uh and see if there's anything that i notice that we can work on and improve um you know we i think the people that were here before me it's obvious built an incredible incredible city i'm so blessed to be sort of at the helm of the city government as city manager. But I am very clear in my mind that those who came before me, uh, both on the elected side, on the administrative side, had have just done in the community, the nonprofit, everybody, it takes a team, have built such an incredible city. But, you know, anything this complicated and with the context within which it operates constantly changing, there's always going to be opportunities for continuous improvement. Um, and you know, I I um, think I think living in community helps me better understand how we can continue to improve. And what what would you say your your management style is like? Do you prefer a, a top down hierarchical structure? Do you, do you take cues and input from the community? Something else entirely? I think, you know, um, I believe city government, local government needs to be client centered. I mean, we we exist to serve the the, the residents of the city of Pasadena. So community input is incredibly important. It's hard when you think about community input because the city has somewhere between 140,000 and 150,000 residents. And, you you know, you, you can't go out and speak to that many people on every issue. I mean, just the thought of it, you know, you can see why it's not feasible. But we have a system in place, that system largely in a system of, you know, a democratic republic that we have, we have people voting uh, for their elected representatives, but those representatives need to be informed, um, need to hear from the folks they represent, need to be out in community, I need to be out in community and listen to what uh, our, our uh, clients essentially are telling us so that we can, you know, create and implement client-centered programs and services uh, that, that that our residents need. Um, so, yeah, so I believe in, in hearing the community uh, in, in various different ways. Um, as far as my management style, I hope to be a problem solver. I think we are all, you know, I wouldn't be here in Pasadena if I didn't already believe in the vision that I think we collectively hold, which is that we want to build a more just and a more inclusive society that keeps us safe, that keeps the streets clean and on and on. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I think that's best done by being a problem solver, by working collaboratively with my management team, um, by trying to 
be a coach and a mentor to those who work with me. Um, and, you know, if need be, I think there are some issues that are going to require some directive, you know, directive to come from me. That's just the nature of how compl complex organizations run themselves. Um, and if necessary, I'll make the directive. But um, many times, I believe if you're forced to make the directive, you sort of won the battle, but you lost the war. Right. You really want to build concurrence and collect of action and collective thought and get everyone on the same page so that people say, yeah, this is the right direction. And as a team, we move the, 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 uh, the city's agenda forward together. And you've been in the role for about three weeks. Are, are you learning anything about the city that's surprising you? And, and also, what are your, your short-term immediate priorities? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think I've just been around so long that nothing surprises me. Um, so I can't say I've been surprised by anything, um, but I've been impressed by a lot of things, mm -hmm. um, which is, is neat to see. Um, it feels to me like things for, for a, a relatively small, well, I don't know that it's small, but smaller, a smaller city than, than the organization I'm used to being in. Um, the amount of issues that we have to, you know, take on and find good solutions to is incredible. Um, it's It's been in the first two or three weeks, kind of like drinking from a fire hose, as they say. And uh, that's great to see. I can't imagine if this uh, city were 10 times bigger, like the organizational structure of the county I came from. It's hard to imagine 10 times the number of issues that I've already been confronted with in this first two or three weeks on the job. Mm -hmm. So maybe a little surprised by that, but mostly impressed by how um, thoughtful the the work that that's done here really is is done in a thoughtful manner right uh, i've only had the chance to sit through one city council meeting and two committee meetings but i've been incredibly impressed first off by the staff reports by the expertise by the values that are shown in those staff reports by the, the, the thoroughness of the reports and then I've been very impressed by our elected officials who take the time to read them thoroughly and ask very good questions of staff and to provide clear direction to us. So um, nothing has surprised me. Uh, the, the work in many respects is sort of the same, just in a different context. Uh, but again, very impressed by everything I've seen. And and what what is the status of hiring the new police chief? Do, do you have a candidate or candidates in mind? When, when will that decision be made? You know, we, we have um, a, a work plan, sort of a timeline in place, and that's going to be um, a, a significant undertaking. Um, so um, I, I think we'll be able to find someone. It, it always depends. I don't want to give a date in some way. You can maybe hear me hesitating because you know, if it's if it's an internal candidate, they can start right away. If it's not an internal candidate, it takes sometimes four to six to eight weeks. I mean, I, I myself, if you don't know, was uh, made an offer in early June, but didn't come until the end of August. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But I did the best I could to transition as quickly as I could. Mm -hmm. It just took that amount of time. So not knowing who's going to be selected, I can't give an exact date, but I can tell you that we are targeting the November, December timeframe if we can. Um, and uh, they were good enough before I even arrived to have uh, to post what they call post the position to get the applications in. And we're in the process of uh, processing those applications and trying to set up both a community panel and sort of a technical panel, if you will, a panel of other law enforcement uh, professionals. Um, of, uh, you know, we're working hard to get a very diverse group of folk um, on both panels uh, to do the initial interviews and then to have a set of final interviews after that. Mm -hmm. yeah, and the criteria criteria for that, are, are you looking for a chief who is going to be have an openness and a willingness to work with the independent police auditor with the, the civilian police oversight commission? Is that part of the criteria? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's uh, what we've decided here in Pasadena, how we're going to work together to build a, uh, a police department that we're all trying to get to. Um, so we have those uh, bodies in place and the police chief is gonna absolutely uh, have to express a willingness to work with those bodies 
uh, and continue to make good progress in all that we've been trying to accomplish with respect to, you know, efforts like community policing and keeping communities safe and helping people get on the right track. And and uh, uh, just uh, very quickly, do you, do you plan to meet with the uh, the different groups from the community in the coming weeks? And how can residents reach out to you, provide you with input or their concerns on city issues? Yeah, you know, it's 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 been. Uh, uh, there's just one of me that makes it a little difficult, uh, and I'm doing my best. I'm pedaling as fast as I can and trying to get out to as many meetings as I can. Uh, I I feel badly for my uh, not badly, but I I you know I know my my assistant has. Uh, a big task in front of her. She tries to find ways for me to both uh, be the head of uh, the city government where I have to sign a lot of things and approve a lot of things or things get caught in the bottleneck, but at the same time, go out and meet everybody um, and um, hear their concerns. But I have done my best to get out to various community meetings and hear what people are saying. We have, um, when we did the, we hired an executive recruiter to help with the police chief hiring. And that person did hold a town hall meeting. I don't remember the exact date. It was before I got here. And we heard from the community in that forum. Um, I'm always open at all the events, you know, I hope I am personable. I try to be. And if people see me and want to talk to me and tell me what they think, I am all ears. Uh, and I will listen with humility and I will listen to hear what the, the, the concerns are so that we can do our best together to find the next police chief that will be someone we can all embrace and work with and grow with. Well, Mr. Marquez, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to speak with us and best of luck as you embark on this important new role. Thank you. And it's very nice to meet you. And I'm excited to be here um, and uh, to learn more about your show and listen to more of your podcasts. Thank you so much. Before we go, here is this month in Pasadena history. It was this month in 1771 when the San Gabriel mission was established, more than two years after an act of arson caused significant damage, including destruction of the roof in 2020. The 251 year old historic property reopened briefly this month before closing again for more repairs. It will be permanently reopened in December. It has a controversial history. When Spaniards arrived in the 18th century, they built the mission with forced labor from Native Americans in the area, who were also forced to convert, convert to Catholicism. 6,000 indigenous Tongva are buried at the mission. Thank you all so much for joining me for this episode of News Wrap Local. Tune in every third Friday of the month at 5 p.m. Learn more at PasadenaMedia.org and JustinDouglasChapman.com. Sign up for my monthly email newsletter to get updates on my work by visiting justinchapman.substack.com. See you next month.